Hei tātou tēnā. Uh, ue a waire a te one tapu, kā hura tanga tāuta te tūraki atu ki tanga tātai, kā hura tanga tātai te tūraki atu ki tanga tāuta. Pērā hoki rā te kōrepe nui, te kōrepe roa, te wāhi awa, te toe toe awa. Whaka mau a tama ki te ara, whaka moe tama ki te ara no tū no rongo, whano, whano, haramai te toki, haumie, huie, taiki. Uh, e te iwi nau mai haere mai, a whakatau mai ki tēnei. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today uh, for our webinar, Sleep Me Safe. Uh, sorry again for the technical hiccups this morning, but hey, Zoom's being uh, overridden by everybody working on it, so I'm sure uh, we're quite of used to it. My name is Kawiti Waitfin and it's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the team. Today's webinar is hosted by A Better Start National Science Challenge and Fano Afina Plunkett. A Better Start National Science Challenge is a collaborative research program working to help children, teenagers, and their whānau achieve the best possible start in life. Its mission is to find practical, evidence-based solutions that make a measurable difference for tamariki, improving the potential for all young New Zealanders to have a healthy weight, good literacy skills, and sound mental health. Whānau Afina Plunkett is a charity and Aotearoa's largest support service for the health and well-being of tamariki under five and their whānau. It offers free Plunkett's nurse visits, a free 24-hour Plunkett line, along with parent groups, education courses, playgroups, and more. Today, you'll help hear from two Sudi academic experts, Emeritus Professor Ed Mitchell and Professor David Tipene-Leach from Ngāti Kahungunu Descent about the latest research and developments in Sudi, including results from the most recent NZ case control study. Uh, before we start our webinar, a little housekeeping. Today's webinar is scheduled for about one hour, including Q&A. All audience members will be automatically muted throughout the session. A recording of today's webinar will also be made uh, available to all attendees and there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar today. Please submit any questions you have throughout using the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom window, not the chat box, as I'm sure you're pretty much used to using. So again, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window to uh, uh, put in any questions you have, and our team will field them to our chairs. Uh, our chairs for today are uh, Professor Barry Taylor, the Deputy Director of the Better Start National Science Challenge, and Fano Afina Plunkett's Chief Nurse, Dr. Jane O'Malley. Welcome to you both, and over to you, Barry. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I guess it's a lesson in life, isn't it? If everybody's in a different room, they, they will get a different story. So uh, hopefully, um, I see there's... Um, at least 235 people on this webinar. So welcome to you all. Uh, the topic that we're going to talk about today is close to my heart. Um, and I'm going to start with two slides before handing over to Ed to talk about the latest uh, case control study in New Zealand. Um, the context I want to paint uh, starts with when I was a house surgeon in Christchurch. Uh, and I got a phone call at six o'clock in the morning uh, from my sister-in-law um, whose baby had just died. And um, that was uh, impactful. It has been uh, sitting with me uh, as a motivation for research in this area for the last 30 plus years. And uh, in those days, uh, 30 years ago, this was not an uncommon story. And so the first slide I'm showing you is in fact, as far as you can, um, get the official st statistics on deaths of babies in the first year of life um, over time. Since the earliest data I, uh, you can get from StatsNZ is 1931. Uh, and you can see that in New Zealand, there has been a steady decline uh, in uh, infant mortality. And then the bottom two lines uh, divide that into deaths in the first month of life, neonatal mortality, uh, and you can see that, uh, and the, the second line, the blue line, is uh, post neonatal mortality from one month to one year of age. And you can see that um, for the first half of the graph, neonatal mortality was higher than post neonatal. Um, but then, uh, really, over the last uh, 20, uh, 15 years anyway, you can see that neonatal mortality has been somewhat above post neonatal. Uh, you can see this dip here in the post neonatal mortality, and Ed will talk about why that happens. But the overall picture since 1931 is of improvement, uh, more rapid and perhaps a bit slower more recently. The next graph um, 
will show you uh, a more recent update. Um, you notice that this data goes up to 2020, so it does go up to de December uh, at the end of last year. And here I'm showing you the separation of Maori and non-Maori post neonatal mortality. So this is just talking about uh, deaths in, from one month to one year of age. Uh, and you can see the uh, drop in post neonatal mortality that occurred here in 1990. You can see a gap in the Maori, um, non-Maori, uh, which is because of the change in the definition used by Stats NZ to define Maoriness. It's changed from a, a genetic uh, a link uh, through to self-identification. Um, and you can see that overall, there continued to be a drop if you follow the yellow line, which is total post neonatal mortality, a slow drop uh, even after 1990, uh, continuing on, and then um, perhaps some leveling off. And indeed, uh, when, we, I, when I started with a, min, uh, a period with the Ministry of Health last year, there was great concern that total post neonatal mortality was actually going up. Uh, and then this last dot point here that you can see in 2020 has come down again, but you've got some complicating factors here. In other words, COVID came along and everybody was shut down um, for large periods and the amount of infections across the country was much less perhaps contributing to uh, a drop in 2020. But certainly sitting at uh, 2019, there was concern of an increasing total, but also especially concerning an increase in Maori uh, post neonatal mortality. So that's the context. Um, overall progress over a long period of time, uh, uh, slowing down, perhaps an increase until 2019, and then one year when COVID was around when uh, things have dropped down again. That's where we are right now, the best um, and I guess the most up-to-date data that currently can be had. Um, and within that context, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ed Mitchell, who probably needs no introduction in New Zealand. He is probably, uh, in my book, uh, probably one of the world's most prominent Sudi researchers. Uh, he's been involved in the, I remember the first meeting we had in uh, Auckland at a, a pediatric society scientific meeting when we uh, got together to organize the first uh, case control study. Uh, and then not so long after that, David Tiffany Leach came along. So the three of us have been involved in research in this area uh, for a very long time. Uh, Ed is now retired and is an emeritus professor at the University of Auckland. Um, he has, uh, uh, I think, numerous honors uh, that I won't repeat, except to say that I do consider him one of our most prominent researchers uh, in the child health area overall. So Ed, uh, we're really looking forward to hearing uh, the most recent results from the third case control study that's been done in New Zealand uh, on Sudi, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Barry, uh, that was very kind of you. Um, let me just get rid of the pictures across it. Um, so as Barry says, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the uh, New Zealand most recent case control study. And I'm presenting this on, I don't have control of the screen. Can oh, thank you. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is just acknowledge a large number of people. That's although I'm presenting this. This represents the work of a, a, a very large study group, um, including international advisors um, Martin Saud from Germany and Peter Fleming, uh, which is one of the sort of key names in Sudi research from the UK. Um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge the steering group. Um, in particular, um, the previous uh, chief coroner, Neil McLean, who without his um, backing and support, this study would never have got off the ground. Um, it was actually really done under the auspices of the uh, chief coroner. I also want to acknowledge um, Communio, who were the people that did the data collection, and in particularly Mel McFarlane, um, who was at the project manager and did quite a lot of the um, interviews herself. So what, what I'm planning to do is talk, describe the uh, 
SUNY nationwide study. I'm just going to outline the main findings. I'm going to share just one or two um, tidbits from uh, new, new findings and then draw a few conclusions and raise a few questions. Um, but why, um, when we sort of think about it, Barry said about the New Zealand case, New Zealand cop death study. Well, this was a three year study back then. So it's, it's actually, you know, over 30 years old now. Um, and, but back then we identified that sleep position, particularly prone lying babies on their tummies, mother smoking, lack of breastfeeding and bed sharing were the major risk factors. And as Barry has already told, told you, we, we launched this program, um, prevention program in 1991. Um, and, but the thing was, is that actually, because we were talking about the, about the results before then, mortality was decreasing from August of uh, 1989. And, and there was a dramatic reduction in SIDS mortality from 250 deaths per year in two years went to 120 and the post neonatal mortality total cause of death dropped six um, down to four per thousand. So what, what did we find new in the study? Well, we weren't, the, we weren't the first one to talk about prone sleeping position, but most of the studies prior to that were very small or badly chosen um, controls. Um, and I think we, we and probably Peter Fleming were the first two that really um, pushed the uh, prone sleeping position. We were the first group to show that the side sleeping position was also a risk. Um, Robert Scrag of our group identified the interaction between bed sharing and smoking, which is a fundamental um, finding. And I'll talk about that later. Um, we actually even measured, because we were looking at all infant care practices, we put things in like um, pacifiers at the, at the request of um, Murray Logerson. Um, I thought to myself, how could that be? But it's been consistent in studies, um, in other studies. Protective effect of sleeping in the same bedroom was shown, independent effect of smoking by the father, showing that postnatal depression was a risk. And we also were able to explain the higher rates of SIDS in Māori, which was just based on the higher prevalence of risk factors, particularly smoking and bed sharing in the Māori population. So why did we want to go on and do a, a new study? Well, I've, I've said it was 30 years old, so things may have changed, but we still had this very high rate uh, of Māori. And so I took this from our original grant application, um, and it related to deaths in 2003, 2007. And you see the European rate was 0.5, but Māori was sort of over four times that, because Pacific Islanders um, were, were 1.3. Um, Asian, intriguingly, had a very low rate. And this total rate of 1.1 was very high compared with other countries. The other factor, which was a, a major um, area of concern, is that 50% of our SUDI cases were now occurring in a bed sharing context. There was lack of information on individual SUDI cases. Information the coroner had to work on was usually just a um, police report um, as, well, as well as the pathologist report, but no detailed investigation of the cases were, um, was really undertaken. And we had no idea really about what the risk factors were in the community. The only studies that were being done were very based on very small surveys done here in Auckland. So the goals of, of this new study was to identify ways of reducing uh, New Zealand's high Asudi mortality rate and that in Māori. And also we said we wanted to try and identify ways that may, that bed sharing with an infant could be done more safely. So we used a case control structure. We covered the whole of New Zealand. We had a, th a 36 month data collection period um, from those dates. 
And we've collected data, um, information by interviews um, with, by trained um, SUDI liaison staff. These, this is these were really are equivalent to the American medical examiner um, or medical legal investigator. We undertook um, some objective measurements, such as measuring mattress softness. And what was really new was the idea of doing a dull reconstruction to try and get parents to um, act out what actually happened. The SUDI cases, um, we were deliberately quite broad in what we were counting, because um, there are a lot of um, diagnostic transfer between one term. In fact, that's probably why SIDS is less frequently used now, is because the better investigation has identified asphyxial deaths, certainly identifying unsafe sleeping, such as bed sharing, but without any evidence of facial occlusion. Um, and then there's the question about the pathology. Um, often infect infections, little patches of bronchopneumonia, for example, might be found but are, are insufficient to explain the death. Um, it includes unascertained, which is um, one of the pathologist's um, favorite diagnoses, um, i.e. they can't say what the cause is. And then the unexplained one, which is really the classic SIDS. And what we excluded was non-accidental injury, obviously accidental causes where death would be expected, such as road traffic crash, um, and deaths related to concealed pregnancies, um, no autopsy, although that was only, we only excluded one case for that. And then all the sort of problems related to um, prematurity. And we excluded ones where there was a, um, a, a clear pathological finding um, with prodromal symptoms and signs. So someone, you know, so a pneumonia death they clearly had a uh, respiratory infection and it wasn't just a little patch of bronchiolitis. And similarly with congenital abnormalities it, that, that were clearly led to death were excluded. So over, that, uh, over this three year study period, there were just over 300 cases referred to the coroner for investigation of which we defined 137 as being within our category. And our interviewers, um, the SUDI liaison staff, did a fantastic job and actually managed to interview 133, that's 97%. Now, the controls were deliberately chosen to be higher risk. So they were selected based on the um, deaths that had occurred previously in uh, DHBs. Um, so South Auckland, which had a higher rate, contributed more controls and it was also ethnically matched. So they were more what we were expecting. So, but the problem we had was by choosing high, high uh, risk controls, we didn't, they had great difficulty finding and interviewing these families. And we only actually got 40% of them. It's a good number, but that always raises the question of selection bias. But the controls as I've come on to later on are really quite high risk. In the study, the mortality rate, the SUDI rate had actually declined from 1.1 to um, 0 0.77, 0.76. Um, but again, Māori were overrepresented. You, know, you can see it's threefold the um, non Māori, non Pacific, and Pacific was um, twofold higher than, um, than, than the non Māori, non Pacific. Now, the, the big risk factors um, are, are things like smoking. So, um, so you'll see, I'm going to present it in, in uh, a number of slides in this form. So we have cases along here, controls along here, and the adjusted odds ratio here. Um, and so you can see that in the cases, 69% of cases, the mother smoked during pregnancy. In the controls, 35% um, were smokers, which of course is much, which illustrates the fact that this is a high risk um, group because one would normally only expect 12 or 13% of controls smoking. Um, but even with this high risk, it showed a, a markedly increased uh, risk 
of death. We also did a separate analysis, and I'm, in, in the interests of time, I'm not going to present the detailed findings of this, um, just, but just the conclusions. We looked at the magnitude of the risk, i.e. The, the odds ratio, and it did not differ between Māori and non-Māori. However, the, the um, prevalence of smoking in the con Māori controls was twice that seen of non-Māori controls. So 48% of the Māori controls smoke compared with 23% of the non-Māori. If we look at sleep position, um, slide in the same or data presented in the same format, um, babies sleeping on the front, 8% died on their front, but only 4.6% of the controls were sleeping on their front. Um, odds ratio 3.3. Actually, actually, it doesn't quite sneak in, but it's certainly consistent with um, um, the findings previously. And side sleeping position, again, odds ratio of 1.5. And this is the sort of what one would expect. I think the other thing which is really striking, at, at least to me, is that the controls, um, there's less than 5% of these high-risk controls were placing their baby prone to sleep. So that message has clearly got through um, to the New Zealand population. And so most, most babies are actually going, being placed to sleep on their backs, which is fantastic. Again, the magnitude of the risk, the odds ratios, for prone sleeping position didn't differ between Māori and non-Māori, and the prevalence of prone sleeping position in Māori controls was identical to that of non-Māori. There are the figures. So this, you know, that's um, been one of the success stories. Now, bed sharing. Well, the first thing to note here is 55% of the babies die in a bed sharing situation. Our controls were 17%, and the adjusted odds ratio was fivefold. So it's a, it's a major risk here. Again, when we looked at the risk from bed sharing alone, we just we find that the odds ratio doesn't differ between Māori and non-Māori. But and the prevalence of bed sharing in the controls was also similar between Māori and non-Māori. Here, here are the um, respective percentages. This, was, this differs from the original New Zealand cot death study where um, Māori controls um, had, a much high, had a higher bed sharing rate than, than non-Māori controls. Seems like the non-Māori controls has actually increased. Now, the in, this, this is, um, there's going to be two slides that, that are relatively complicated, and this is the, the first of them. This, is, this illustrates the interaction between maternal smoking and bed sharing. So it looks at each combination. So the best group to be in is non-smoking, non-bed sharing. And so you can see that even in our controls, 50% 50, 50 of them are, do, are doing the best. Even though they're high risk, they're doing the best. Um, but very few of the cases, just 17%, were, were, had neither smoking nor bed sharing. If there was bed sharing but not smoking, the risk was, well, it wasn't it was significantly increased. If there was smoking and not bed sharing, then the risk was increased by two point ninefold. But if the baby was exposed to both uh, smoking in utero and bed sharing, the odds ratio is a staggering 30. Um, very highly significant uh, interaction. And so even in this, so in, in this data set, we show, we confirmed this very significant interaction. We looked at the magnitude of the risk, you know, this sort of 30 fold, and that didn't differ between Māori and non-Māori. But what did differ is the combination of smoking and bed sharing, the proportion. Um, 
that were exposed to that was three times higher in the Mare controls than in non-Mare, 9.6 9 to 3.3. So a lot of figures there, but just to, just to summarize it very quickly into words, bed sharing in association with maternal smoking is the major factor. And we need to uncouple that either by stopping smoking or stopping bed sharing. Maternal smoking is in pregnancy continues to be very important. Prone sleeping position is, probably, is a risk, but very few infants are now exposed to that. Um, and the, the magnitude of the odds ratios are exactly the same for Māori and non-Māori. Um, but the real problem is, is that the proportion of Māori who smoke is higher than non-Māori. This is obviously an area that needs to be tackled um, with vigour. Well, the str strengths and limitations, well, one of the biggest strengths, of course, is that 97% um, of the cases were interviewed. We deliberately selected, we deliberately selected high-risk controls, but this resulted in only 40% of controls being seen, which raises the possibility of selection bias. However, just to uh, illustrate the point, even the controls that we did manage to see um, were high risk, um, you know, 50% were Māori, 35% smoking, and alcohol in, um, ingested in the last 24 hours, um, 8%. So I wanted to just discuss the sort of remaining areas of controversy. There's a strong group in the UK that argue that um, bed sharing is only a risk if the hazards are present. And they define hazards as being um, uh, it, the baby being exposed to smoking um, and mothers drinking alcohol or drugs or sleeping on the sofa. Um, so this has caused us, uh, you know, we disagree with this. And I just want to quickly just come, overcome, discuss the evidence for this. In the absence of smoking, is bed sharing a risk? Well, I'll show you some data from Bob Carpenter um, and in the next slide. But yes, this is the case, especially in babies under, th under 13 weeks. In the absence of maternal alcohol and drugs, is bed sharing a risk? The same study confirmed that that was the case. Does sleeping on a sofa increase the risk of SUDI? Well, the answer is yes, I'm quite convinced of it. And this is one, one piece of new information come, that's come out from the study, which I'm very happy to share with you. Very few babies share with an infant on, on a sofa. We had just one control infant out of the 250 odd, um, although 8% 8, 8 of the infants died on a sofa. So yes, sofa is um, probably a, a risk. Um, but it doesn't account for very many of the, many of the deaths. One of the things which um, the UK group have been arguing is if we tell people not to bed share, they will sofa share. So we're so it's encouraged by the advice not to bed share. I think that's extremely unlikely, given that just one control infant was on a sofa, and I, my suspicion suspicion is that is that the sofa sh uh, sharing is um, being driven by poverty and crowding this is the only place where this where the family um, where the mother can sleep um, unfortunately we don't didn't actually ask that specific question so this is the second and final complicated slide and this is from um, the carpenter's work and he put five case control studies, including the New Zealand cop death study together, and looked at the risk of um, bed sharing um, by smoking and by age. So along the bottom is the first six months of life. And if both parents smoke, they have an incredibly high end in the early ages, uh, early um, age of the infant's life. So here, you know, the first month of life, you're getting an odds ratio of 60. And that gradually decreases with age. But if neither parent smoked, 
then again, there is an increased risk, um, but a much lower magnitude. But in that, in that it, it remains significant out to about 14 weeks. Um, and then it's not significant. Um, at two weeks, bed shearing in the non-smoking category is given an odds ratio of about eight. Um, and as you can see, it comes down to about three at terms um, 12 weeks. So I think, you know, I think one can't argue with the message that the safest place for your baby to sleep at night during the first six months is on their back, in a cot, in their room. And so this is my opinion. I'm, you know, I'm, not, talking, I'm not talking on behalf of the study group. I think there needs to be a lot of more discussion rather than just saying bed sharing is a risk, but discussing what's going to happen at night, particularly feeding at night. And then one of the questions I ask is, which is safer? If, if Is falling asleep in a chair more risky or is falling asleep while bed sharing? Well, I think falling asleep while bed sharing is 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 going to be less risky than falling asleep on a sofa or a chair. But the, the issue is, even if the risk is, is less, if more parent babies are doing it, the, from a population perspective, that may well be the more risky behaviour. We know that duration of bed sharing is associated with risk. Uh, nil, not bed sharing at all, is the lowest risk, less less than two hours, two to five. And if you sleep all night, then that's the highest risk. So would using a timer or alarm on the smartphone limit the time of sleep if mum fell as inadvertently fell asleep? Um, I would think so. We need to do some studies to, to show that. So in conclusion, our findings indicate that risk factors identified in the original study are still relevant today which implies that the current SUDI prevention messages are still appropriate. So the, um, uh, the, these are the um, two um, references from the case control study. Um, this is the reference from Bob Carpenter's one, and there will be a fourth one down here um, relatively shortly, because um, we're push publishing a paper on hazards um, in Journal of Paediatrics, which hopefully will be coming out uh, fairly soon. So I'd fin like to finish by um, acknowledging HRC for funding this feasibility in the main study, Cure Kids for their support, um, Communio, who man established and managed the project, particularly the director and um, Mel McFarland, who was our project manager, and Yvonne Ledesman um, was the lead medical legal investigator um, in Miami, um, and she came over to New Zealand and now trained our SUDI liaison staff in how to do um, death scene investigations. And a special thanks to all the SUDI liaison staff who, did, who conducted the interviews. So thank you. Um, thank you, Ed. Um, I'm, I'm aware of time. Um, there's a, quite a lot of questions coming up, which uh, Ed will be looking at while um, David talks, and I'll introduce David. Uh, David Tiffany Leach um, has been part of, uh, I guess, the Sudi research arena ever since he came back uh, from overseas. Um, he started as a passionate young man, and he's ended up as a passionate middle-aged man um, uh, in this area. He, he's... Um, chaired the recent uh, expert advisory group that was convened by the Ministry of Health to look at, uh, at the Saudi risk, especially at the time when we thought the Saudi rate for Maori was uh, still going up. Uh, and um, uh, he's been a pleasure to work with. Uh, we've um, done a lot of research together. So it's really is really nice to ask David to uh, take over the next, uh, next stage. Um, okay, I think I've got the sussed, Barry. Can am I am I working? Yes, I can hear. You. We can hear you. 
Right, right. Well, me mehe atua nau kia tātou, tātou e whakarongo mai nā ki nā kōrero e tāna ki our SIDS, um, te nā kōtou. Um, firstly, just let me acknowledge um, Ed and Barry, as I say, who have worked together over a long period of time, over 30 years, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a long haul, and it's been a, a good haul, and it's been a, um, a good, if you like, mateship as we've been going um, through these years, but the, the the presentation that I'm going to do almost sounds like it's in conflict with what Ed's saying. So I just want to pre-warn you, it's not in conflict. But there is another view that I want to put uh, because you saw the in, in what Ed presented, the, the drop in deaths that have been around, um, around working with risk factors. Um, and what I'm wanting to present really is the idea that looking at the tail of the Sudi epidemic um, is not about looking at risk factors. Um, and it's about um, taking power away, if you like, from the group of people who presently control um, Sudi prevention and passing the baton, the baton um, across to Maori and Pacific people in Maori and Pacific communities to do things slightly differently. So let's see if this machine works. No, it doesn't, Barry. I don't think I don't have control. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, so I just want to introduce this by, by saying that SIDS prevention, SUDI prevention, SIDS prevention um, in Māori communities has changed over, this, over these 30 years. And first of all, um, pay, making acknowledgement of the Māori SIDS prevention team that was based at the Auckland University. That was the first team, if you like, where the argument is that we, we, we get, got out there and we got control of the message. The second iteration of that team was the Whakawatū team, which was also based at Auckland University. And the Whakawatū team was um, with me, with us, uh, with the team when we introduced the Wahakura. Um, and the argument here is that we got control of the intervention. Um, and the third iteration of the team um, is, you know, and the team is getting wider and wider. It, it looks like the whare pora. It looks like um, taking control of the antenatal space um, and acknowledging here um, Hapai Te Hauora, um, led by Faye Selby Law and the work that they're doing in this area. So yes, once upon a time there was SIDS, we talked about that, there was a big disparity. Um, the, this, the, these were um, numbers that Ed has already talked about. Um, and then we had the COTDER study, which defined the SIDS risk. Um, and as you can see from this graph, when the news broke out and things were um, changing in the mainstream community, in the Pākehā community, they weren't changing all that much. And I presented it pretty much as a straight line for the first couple of years, they weren't changing at all. The only thing that changed was the disparity, which went up to around about six. Um, so here's, on the basis of that, the Māori SIDS prevention program was funded. Uh, we managed to get hold of really Peti Hare Tipu, who, who led this team. We got control, as I say, of the messages. We were looking at post-mortems, we were working with coroners, we were especially active in the grief counselling area. We went from marae to marae, from Māori place to Māori place. And we did present the risk-based, risk factor type messages, but we had them in a, how would you say, in a, in a Māori fashion and in a Māori way. Um, and the, the, the Māori SIDS rates fell. And whilst I'd like to say they felt because of the Māori SIDS prevention team, who knows exactly why they failed, but clearly some of the risk behavior changed, um, rates fell, but remembering that rates are still going down in the Pākehā community at the time, the disparity remained pretty much the same. Um, the next thing that happened in the story, if you like, is that the rates stopped changing across communities. They stopped decreasing. It took, it took me, two or three years to realize what was going on. Um, and there is a plateau that you can see here that stretches for about, um, around about 10 years, a plateau in Sudi deaths, but it was around about 2004, 2005, um, that we began to think, well, 
you know, we know what's responsible for this. It's bed sharing where there was smoking in pregnancy. How are we going to work with this? And we decided smoking in pregnancy was pretty difficult to do, a uh, pretty difficult message to pass, um, and certainly not one that was in the control of the Māori community. So we moved to the idea of can we change bed sharing? Can we create things to be um, safer? And we invented the wahakura in the attempt to try and create a safer shared sleeping environment for um, babies. And with communities on board weaving wahakura, we felt at the time that hello Māori now have control of the intervention. And remembering that this is still very much working with the risks, the risks being trying to get rid of the risk of bed sharing, um, because we know that it's bed sharing if there was smoking in pregnancy, which was doing um, Māori infants no good. The Pepe pod, which came very quickly um, afterwards, um, was a plastic version of the same thing, and it created capacity for the safer um, bed sharing um, device, if you like, the safer bed sharing plan. And with the support of the DHBs, the Safe Sleep Program, uh, which was distributing safe sleep uh, devices to families who were at high risk of SIDS, the Safe Sleep Program was born. Over the next um, period of time, and um, the time that we've measured here is from 2009 to 2015, um, death rates fell um, by 29%, mainly amongst Māori and mainly in the areas where these safe sleep devices were heavily um, subscribed to. We thought at the time that we were saving approximately 15 babies a year. It seemed to be a really good thing to do. Um, um, and we would have claimed, if you like, that it was the safe sleep program that was responsible for this fall. Um, there's the Wahakura in 2006, safe sleep introduced in, 20, in 2011, and then that drop over those following years. So indeed, the team, the safe sleep team, um, put their hands up and claim credit for that drop. Um, and we wrote it up and we advocated to um, the Ministry of Health. Um, this is, it, it's very clearly on this team and, and, and in this um, plan, boots and all. Um, and we got these, um, we got the safe sleep program um, funded over a period of time, can I, oops, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go backwards. Um, there we go, there we go. So there we go. So we, we got funded um, and then this is what the, that looks like without all my arrows on it. And the first question that we asked at the time, um, here we go, we've got this big decrease in deaths and then suddenly you start looking at, for the decrease year after year after year, and it's not to be seen. And so again, with this business of drawing straight lines, uh, was this just another plateau that we were seeing? Um, and were we, in, were we in trouble again? Um, so the first question that you ask is, is what the minister said in, two, uh, in 2017, we're gonna go with it sorry, in 2016, we're going to go with it, but it didn't really get up and start until around about two, uh, at the beginning of 2018. And so you're looking at those things and we're asking the question, is that what's going on? Was it the ministry's problem? Was it their delay? Because in their delay, what they did, the Ministry of Health, was that they closed down the Māori SIDS prevention networks. Um, they took away any Māori control of SIDS prevention. Um, they took the they halved the total amount of money that was going to Māori um, and then they put the other 75% um, of it, 80% of it, into the hands of non-Māori people. Um, the regional coordinators, the Māori coordinators were out, Pākehā nurses were in, and they cut the funding up into uh, four different pockets and then all the DHBs. These um, pockets of funding were poorly coordinated, there wasn't uh, the, the information um, collection was very, very poor. Um, and it was, in my recent words, it, I have been known to describe it as a real schmozzle. The other questions being asked at the same time was, well, is this the end of what you can get for trying to deal to safe sleep? Is, do we have to move somewhere else? Do we have to now seriously address smoking and pregnancy? 
because we hadn't, we had ignored it because it was so hard to do, or indeed, do we need to go into the antenatal service gaps that we know existed? So the third iteration of Māori SIDS prevention um, is in its infancy, is called Te Whare Poro Hene Te Iwe Iwe. It's a place where essentially where pregnant Māori women go, they learn to weave. You wouldn't be surprised to know that they end up weaving a wahakura, but of course they start with um, umbilical ties and little baskets to put the placenta in, um, one to put the, um, the umbilical remains, the remnants in when, when they fall off, those sorts of things. And the idea being if you can get groups of Māori women together and that they're networking and that they get control of their pregnancy, then they're much more likely to um, network in with other community and other health services. And so what we're saying is that this, again, is another uh, iteration of SUDI prevention and it's Māori control of the antenatal period. Now, it, it is a bit of a move away from the risk-related stuff, talking more about support, but you can see that I'm still a doctor and I'm still looking at risks and the risks that I'm looking here at is lack of antenatal care and lack of connection into associated services like um, breastfeeding support uh, and smoking cessation. So what I want to say now is, well, okay, what's new and why am I on this? Why am I here talking today? Uh, and so there has been some new data and this new data is really interesting. And the reason why it's interesting is because um, it gives us it gives some credence to what I'm talking about at the moment. So yes, there are still the same risk findings in the 64 coronial SUDI reports that have been reviewed, and Barry was one of the reviewers, um, from July 2019 to June 2020, that have been recently reviewed, finding bed sharing, maternal smoking at infant sleep position, not surprisingly, still really important. But there is some new stuff. And they asked about financial security, um, they asked about the condition that um, the, the infant and the carers were in. Um, they asked those sorts of questions um, that had not really previously been, uh, been established. And so if you look at this, we always thought now, remembering that this is definitely a Māori and Pacific group of people whose families are having Sudi. We know where they live. We know they're in the poor side of town. But this is a quote, poverty and housing unaffordability resulted in most cases residing in shared accommodation, boarding, renting, and living in one room. You know, only 20% of the families of kids who died um, from Sudi said that they were not living in a distressed economic situation. So poverty clearly is a huge issue here. The second thing that they asked about was um, how parents were and how the children were. Um, and again, um, this is a quote from the report that Barry did. Extreme maternal or paternal tiredness was a significant theme in Sudi cases, alongside caring for an acutely unwell infant or an infant with a pre-existing condition. In other words, ch um, children who are unwell um, being cared for essentially by parents who are not so much unwell as totally and absolutely exhausted. The other important stuff was that it was clear, and Ed alluded to this, it was clear that these parents knew um, about risk factors, um, but were not in a position to be able to, to do what the risk factor information said to do. And here we are, we're talking about um, bed sharing, and of course we're talking about um, smoking in pregnancies. Um, smoking, again, clearly understood, but people unable to take advantage of smoking cessation um, opportunities. So the EAG, this is the expert advisory group, um, was moved to look toward the bigger picture. Worn out parents, sick kids who are choosing to bed share or who are unable to not bed share, living in poverty, unable to do safe sleep, health services, we question the ability of health services ability to be able to engage with whānau. Um, and, we had, and we looked at this 
scenario where there was a whole bunch of services who really don't talk to each other. And so we, need, we said that this really points to a need to look beyond influencing infant care practice. Um, we recommended the EAG that, um, that the relief of poverty is a fundamental measure in the prevention of SUDI deaths, um, that support for Māori and Pacific leadership and the centralization of the prevention program in under that leadership uh, is necessary, that we needed to get a whole order wellbeing approach to SUDI prevention, a holistic, um, a widely supportive prevention approach um, with workers who look like the families that we're talking about, Māori and Pacific workers, using programs that really are culturally anchored for Māori and Pacific families. Um, we've been here before. I mean, these are four papers that we wrote 20 years ago that are saying much this sort of thing. They were railing against the idea that following risk-based um, um, lines of prevention was the right thing to do, and that, we, that a wider approach um, to social conditions needed to be looked at. Um, and here we are with the whare border, which is really is, the, I think, the, the, um, the, an expression of moving toward a Māori and Pacific control program, um, dealing with family-centric reports, using Māori and Pacific workers, doing things that are culturally appropriate. And so thus ends my argument, Barry. Kia ora tata. Thank you. Um, I have to take a moment to unmute. Um, David, thank you very much. Um, the, this is a complex area, um, and we're clearly at the um, tail end, but we're having 40 to 50 deaths a year. Uh, of uh, babies that die suddenly and unexpectedly. If we were living in Scandinavia or had their rates, we would have four or five babies dying a year. So there's still uh, a long, well, not a long way, we've come a long way, but there's still a way to go to get to the rates which we should have by international comparison. There's lots of questions and uh, we're limited by time. I think we'll have two or three, and I'm just going to put two or three of them together. The first to Ed, there's a lot of questions around smoking and pregnancy, uh, the direct effect of it, why is it a risk factor, uh, and uh, does it have uh, any, uh, is it useful to stop smoking during pregnancy? Um, and uh, can, can you just uh, briefly go through some of the smoking uh, causality issue? Sure. Um, epidemiological studies don't tell you what the mechanism are. All they do is tell you what the associations are. But we know that smoking has some profound effects. It reduces the birth weight by about 150 grams on average, which means that some babies have a much higher long, um, uh, reduction in weight. And we know that birth weight is a risk factor. We um, know that it has a profound effect on the nervous system of the baby. Um, particularly affecting arousal. So babies that um, have been exposed to smoking um, uh, have reduced arousal response and so can't get out of at-risk positions. Um, from the epidemiological stuff, um, not directly from our study, but there's a clear relationship with the amount smoked. And there's a very nice study that's been um, done um, with by the Microsoft people um, that showed that there's a very strong linear relationship from, from one to 20 cigarettes a day, and then it flattens out. Um, so you've got to get, get down um, below, um, as low as you can possibly get. What they were also able to show was that um, mothers that quit smoking in early pregnancy um, have um, reduced their risk considerably, um, the baby's risk considerably, but it's still not huge. And also um, showing that reduction in the number of cigarettes smoked is even smaller effect. So the, the, what is really required is the mothers to make a decision to stop smoking before they even get pregnant when they've decide that they're going to try and try for a child. 
And I know we have um, a large number of um, unplanned pregnancies in New Zealand. Um, and so that's a difficult, uh, difficult one. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, just one question for David, and then we'll move to Jane to do a sort of uh, overall summary. Um, David, there's a few questions coming through around um, safe sleeping uh, while, while in the same bed, uh, using different devices, soft-sided versus hard-sided. Can you comment on um, safety during bed sharing? Well, I can't um, comment on any other devices other than the Wahakura or the Pepe Pod. So the Wahakura and the Pepe Pod have both got reasonably um, strong, robust sides, um, with the Pepe Pod being hard and immovable, and the Wahakura being a little bit sharp and it creaks if you lie on it. So they are they're good and, and they're and they're much safer than direct bed sharing. So you know I've gone gone away from. Um, saying safe sleeping environment, they are safer sleeping environments than um, direct bed sharing, which is clearly dangerous uh, if you smoked in pregnancy. The problem, of course, as Ed has said, is smoking in pregnancy. You know, um, yes, there was, Ed made the illusion before about um, if there were no smoking in pregnancy, is bed sharing okay? And there are huge numbers of people who would say, absolutely, it's okay. Um, I think that what we have is we have a situation where in the tail of the, of the epidemic, um, Sudi now remains in poor communities, um, in deprived communities in New Zealand. This happens to, happens to mean brown communities. Uh, and, and that's similar in lots of places in the world. And we know that smoking is high in deprived communities. And we know that deprived communities don't have a lot of resource. And one of the things they do is that they don't have the resource that seems to be able to support them to make hard changes when they're in difficult places. And so the whole move toward the safe sleeping, the safer sleeping environment was an effort, you know, and I'll, I'll stand up for the effort, but was an effort to try and work with what we could do. So making this thing safer, trying to do it with a wahakura that uh, might appeal to the sense of indigeneity, mildiness, whatever you like, naturalness, um, that's where we've gone um, with the safe sleeping, um, the safer sleeping environment. Thank you, David. Uh, I will hand over to Jane for a sort of summary statement. Um, thanks, Barry. and. Um... Uh, thanks to Ed and, and David, like someone Rick, someone made a statement in the chat about the um, the magnitude of the work that you guys have done over uh, over many decades now. And Ed, you took us through a a, um, a history of the research and uh, you know the risk, the protective factors. They haven't changed significantly over time. And David, you talked to us about time to pass the baton over to Māori communities and that we've got the same stats and the same risks, but there's new stuff in financial security, care fatigue, the ability of services to engage, integration, and then the new recommendation around culturally anchored responses. So um, a huge amount to take in in one hour. And I see someone ask, can we have the papers that, that will be coming, David, I'm sure. Um, so I, I don't have anything more to add except our gratitude to um, to our leaders that, you know, from practitioner point of view, we're looking for advice, we're looking um, for solutions and, um, you know, we're willing to be led and enter into conversations with you. So thank you so much. Um, nā mihi ku, uh, nā mihi, um, to you all. Oh, tēnā tato, uh, Barry, if that concludes our webinar, would you like me to close us off with a karakia? Yes, please. Oh, pai, oh, and I'm sorry, uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all the questions. Uh, we've answered some of them as we've gone, but um, I'm sure that uh, all the presenters and myself would be happy to answer our questions if they want to send them directly to us.
Ura. And on a personal note, it was a pleasure for me as a Papa Māori to weave my baby's, my first baby's um, wahakura and have her sleep side by side with us. So it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. Nā reira, uh, tēnā tātou mihia kia nā kia tātou katoa, ki ka pita tātou webana ki te karakia. Nā reira, unuhia, 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 te uru tapunui, kia wātea, kia māma, te ngākau, te tinana, 